You're listening to Have the Nerve, a podcast by Spinal Cord Injuries Australia. For this episode, we discuss bowel management from surgical to non-surgical options, digestive management, and what to keep in mind when going out as well as intimacy. Hi, I'm Edwina. I'm one of the clinical nurse consultants working with Coloplast, and I actually cover New South Wales. Coloplast develops products and services for people who require urology and continence care. This is one of two episodes about continence care. We're releasing them at the same time, so you can feel free to listen to the episode that's most relevant to you, or listen to both. So I've been with uh, Coloplast for about two years. Uh, Prior to that, um, I did uh, nearly 20 years in intensive care and emergency medicine. An incredible privilege to be involved in such a private area of people's lives, Um, because I guess the, the bladder and bowel really are a private thing that people don't tend to talk about. Um, which is really a bit silly because we all have to do a wee and we all have to do poo because that's that's how we survive and that's how our body gets rid of waste. It's a shame people actually don't talk about it more as as being a bit of a normalised thing, but um, unfortunately people do shy away from it and um, it, it's lovely that I actually have the privilege of being able to help people with something that can actually be quite debilitating. And that's why we're here today, to basically talk about all the things that are A bit awkward, frankly, a little bit gross at times. But completely normal and completely necessary. Completely normal. Um, Okay, so let's talk about how having a spinal cord injury can, or a neurological disability can affect the bowel. Is there anything we have to consider for people who have had, like immediately have an injury and for later on during the injury? So probably really good to start off with um, what they call a neurogenic bowel, which is, is essentially when you have that loss of normal bowel function that you do when you have a spinal cord injury or something that causes a neurological problem like maybe MS or spina bifida. Um, And and basically what happens, it's a nerve problem. So almost very similar to your neurogenic bladder that we were talking about earlier is um, basically it damages the nerves that control the lower part of your body, the lower part of your colon and, and getting waste out. It basically makes that normal ability of being able to get rid of waste um, a little bit difficult can either cause constipation or bowel accidents or a little bit of both. When you immediately have an in, a traumatic injury, for example, uh, are there things that happen that are quite immediate to the actual trauma itself, and then things that might either progress as the years go by? So it's probably a little bit hard because um, spinal shock really occurs in that acute um, spinal cord injury stage and can last up to three months. So in that three month period, it's probably very hard to. Um, make a decision then as to what's going to happen long term and how your bowels are going to react. Um, the other thing you might find is also people might do really well with their bowels in the beginning, but as time goes on, maybe medications become less effective or treatments become less effective. Or, you know, let's be honest, we may get a little bit older, the bowels get a little bit more sluggish um, and, and just may need to be reviewed. Everybody is different. In regards to um, thinking about muscles and nerves in your bowel basically if the muscles and the nerves don't work together your bowel actually isn't going to work properly the nerves are what control your muscles in your bowel they're things that signal when your bowel's full so it registers a stool um, and that's what signals when your bowel's full and you need to go to the toilet and obviously when you damage those nerves this can actually be interrupted you'll probably hear me call uh, talk about a lot about something called peristalsis um, so peristalsis is basically um, that simple snake movement of the bowel that causes that contraction, that muscle contraction along the bowel to basically push everything through. Um, if we want to be a bit more technical, <laughs> pushing everything through. So when you have a spinal cord injury, unfortunately those muscles and those nerves don't really work together and you don't get that lovely peristaltic movement to push everything through. Generally when you have a high injury, so... Um, let's say we're looking at T12 and above. So T12 is about halfway down your back. There and above, generally, you have problems with slower movement, um, potentially leading to constipation. They don't have the, the feeling of the bowel being full. A little bit of difficulty sometimes controlling the sphincter. Often people can have trouble actually emptying, whereas often in the lower bowel injury, so T12 and below, the sphincter, so the sphincter basically is your, your anus, so that the little opening in your bottom um, that often stays open so what happens is it's really hard to hold the stool in it's just it's just accidentally emptying emptying the whole time 
So that can be one of the other big, big tackles we have depending on the level of injury. People can definitely have a combination of both. So they can have problems going as well as problems holding it in. So really comes down to the individual and how they're affected, but really can have a huge impact impact on your quality of life when you when you can't go to the toilet. It's not just a level of injury issue. It's actually different for literally everyone. So between you having one client to another client, even if they have the same injury, can have completely different toileting methods. Absolutely. And also, you know, taking into account when you've got your your incomplete and your complete spinal cord injury. So incomplete is when you've got a your bit of damage, your complete is completely severed. So that that can really affect it as well as to what type of injury. I think the biggest thing um, I always take into account is what people were like pre-injury. Um, so pre-injury, maybe, you know, it's actually really normal. Um, a normal bowel movement is anywhere from um, three times a day to three times a week. So everybody is different um, and the body, body reacts differently as well. What I like to do is find out what people were doing pre-injury. So maybe they were going to the toilet every three days. That was really normal for them. And then their, their new routine would probably have to, you know, mimic what they were doing pre, pre-injury. pre So people might actually be a little bit taken aback by hearing you say three times a week, for example, as opposed to every day. The the gamut of normal is so big. It's, it's absolutely enormous. I mean, um, you know, I, I certainly know me. I get up in the morning, I have my coffee. Yeah, a good 20 minutes later, I know I'm ready to go to the toilet. So everybody um, is completely different and actually functions differently. So there's no standard, yes, it's normal to go every single day and it's normal to do this. So normal is a really broad range. Hmm. It's figuring out what their normal is. Yeah, you know, people who may be able to do it independently may not be able to do it independently. For those who are unable to go to the bathroom independently, what are the surgical, non-surgical options that have been made available? People may not know about it or might be trying something and don't really know what else is out there. So what's out there at the moment? So generally, um, it, it's obviously really important that people are tied into to maybe a, a spinal nurse um, or a spinal specialist that's helping them guide through this process as well. Definitely, um, I would say definitely start out with good diet and lifestyle, plenty of exercise, plenty of water, good fibre in your diet. Of course, that's all, always easier said than done. So those kinds of things you really have to start out with addressing first. Obviously, then you can go down to your medications. So whether that's oral tablets to help you go to the toilet, oral tablets to soften the stool to help it come out, or whether you then go to enemas, which are basically something that is put in the bottom um, to help empty your bowels. Often that's where people start out after they have an initial spinal cord injury, the the done treatment. Mm. After a period of time, we may find that it's actually ineffective It doesn't work for them. Sometimes if you have people with a higher injury, um, bowel care can be quite difficult. So looking at something, a surgical, a permanent thing like a stoma um, would definitely be more appropriate. Obviously, it's something that's done in discussion with your healthcare professional to decide what is actually the best option for you. What we actually um, have at Coloplast is we have something that kind of sits in between those two. So basically we've got peristine or transanal irrigation so um, essentially what that is it basically involves inserting a catheter in the into the bottom inflating a balloon which uh, acts like a plug um, popping in some lovely lukewarm tap water and um, over the toilet obviously and then you remove the catheter the stool and the water comes out and essentially um, you then empty that lower part of your bowel so the theory is either every day or every second day. So um, often what we find is people aren't having accidents in between uh, and people are staying continent. Um, it's a really effective treatment. Something that people may not consider is that depending on the level of spinal cord injury, unlike the bladder-related issues that come along with this disability, bowel-related issues can mean that people can spend literal hours at the toilet. I think... One of the biggest things I've seen in my job is people who are completely debilitated by and controlled by their bowels. So they spend three, four, five hours a day managing their bowels, 
trying to get them to work because let's be honest, your, your bowels are, it, it's your body's waste product. Your body needs to get rid of it. it it's waste. As much as we may not like to think about it, it's actually vital uh, uh, and it's really important. So often something like peristine can just reduce the time that you're spending and you're not spending all day thinking about trying to empty your bowels, spending hours on it, having accidents in between, uh, maybe not being able to empty your bowels properly going out. I mean, th there's nothing harder than maybe trying to maintain a job, maintain a social life, catch up with your friends, um, do all of those things that you really want to do to try and maintain your social aspects and your independence that, that really is um, impacted heavily when your bowels aren't working properly. So the peristine, is that self-administered? Generally, yeah. So it can either, it either be done by carers if they normally do your bowel care. Um, a pretty good rule of thumb for me is if you can wipe your bottom, you can generally do peristine yourself. So you can generally do it independently. I, I think that's the biggest thing is that we're, we're trying to put people back in control of them saying, okay, 8 o'clock in the morning, this is, this is when suits me. I'm going to have my bowel care done. And then I really don't have to think about this till 8 o'clock tomorrow. So typically, um, if you're doing this sort of bowel care, you've said that it actually takes time away from people essentially spending quite a lot of time in their day thinking about something that a lot of able-bodied people may not think about or whatever. How much less time does it actually mean for the user? Look, it's really um, individual but um, most people can get up to um, under about half an hour. So essentially what you do is that um, you start the, the peristine. It can take one to two minutes to get the water in. Um, and then we do recommend people sit on the toilet for 30 minutes after having the water in there because that water does two things. One, it, it makes the stool nice and slippery and helps the stool come out. So what is it out? The other thing that water does is it stimulates peristalsis. Okay, this is this snake movement that I was talking about before. So when you have a spinal cord injury, you don't really have that um, lovely smooth snake movement that pushes that pushes the stool through the bowel. So what the peristin actually does, it stimulates that peristaltic movement to get the bowel to kick off and go, right, we're going to empty what's in here. Okay, okay. You touched on uh, how keeping to, I guess, a routine um, is, is quite important to the point where you said it was actually uh life dependent could you talk a little bit more about the risks and i guess why essentially it's it's basically your life depends on this moving through well i mean i i guess looking at um your body getting rid of waste if you've got um feces that's staying in your body what basically happens is you're going to end up with a bowel obstruction. So a bowel obstruction is basically when the, the feces can't get out and generally it's a surgical intervention um, or a time in hospitals. So a bowel obstruction is a really um, like can be a life-threatening thing, hence why it's really important that we're actually not ending up with bowel obstructions. We're actually emptying our bowels really effectively. Looking at something like peristine, um, obviously it's hmm. not quite as invasive as a stoma. Um, so when you have a stoma, it actually requires, it's, a, it's surgery, it's a surgical opening that they create in um, the abdomen, which is basically where your feces comes out and it goes into a bag. So that's, that's how a stoma works. So that's a surgical procedure. So with a surgical procedure comes an anaesthetic, comes an operation and all those um, other risk factors as well. However, that can obviously sometimes be the most appropriate thing for people depending on their lifestyle and their injury. When you look at the peristine, there of course are risks because it's still an invasive procedure. You're sticking a catheter into your bottom, into your anus. Um, so there is of course a risk of perforation. Basically a bowel, bowel perforation is a medical emergency. It requires emergency surgery. The reason, um, looking at the risk factors, risk factors of bowel perforation when you have a colonoscopy is about one in a thousand. When you're doing peristine, it's two in 500,000. The reason I think with peristine is that we have clinical nurse consultants. We also work really closely with our clinicians. We have an assessment form that we love all of our patients to have done by a medical professional. We like to have a PR check, which is basically finger in the bottom 
to make sure that there's nothing there that's going to cause any excess problems uh, or, you know, unnecessary problems. So we kind of are doing all these checks and making sure that it's the most appropriate treatment for people and that it's the safest treatment for people as well. Obviously, there's times when we don't recommend it, Mm -hmm. when people have bowel, current bowel bowel cancer, pregnancy is not recommended. So there are times when we actually will actually not recommend. It's not always for everybody. Not one thing and one treatment fits every single person. Everyone is different. But I think we like to make sure that the right people are using our products. So they're going to be successful and they're going to be safe. In our last discussion about bladder management, we we talked uh, in great detail about urinary tract infections and the types of catheter use and um, bladder care. Is there anything that's similar in for bowel management? Um, Probably not really. Um, you probably your biggest issues that come in regards to bowel care is hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are really common. Um, I would say just about everyone has hemorrhoids. When they become a problem is when they get quite large, where they start to bleed regularly, and that's when you need to look at things like surgical intervention. Other than that, things like a prolapse can be a problem, especially with a spinal cord injury. Okay. So essentially, what happens with a prolapse is that the bowel drops down. So it makes obviously emptying that bowel difficult because the colon gets blocked off uh, and makes it very, very hard to empty. So um, when we're talking about things like moving digestive, uh, like moving the food and moving the feces through the bowel and the difficulty, some of it is also because people with spinal cord injuries or wheelchair users or whatever are not standing and moving intermittently like through the day so that none of it's not really work in that respect and you did touch on diet uh, a little bit earlier would you like to talk a little bit more about the importance of diet for people with mobility issues who have bowel management issues absolutely so i think it's really important that if you're having issues definitely have a dietitian and have a dietitian involved they're probably the best ones to um, give you individual advice so highly recommend that that that's essentially what they do that's their bread and butter so they're the best ones to give advice generally what you need is basically you need to have a good form of stool so something like fiber helps form that stool up a little bit to make it easier to pass through lots and lots of water so obviously water is one of the things that helps move that stool through and obviously in that last bit of bowel movement is when a lot of the water is actually taken out of the stool from the body that's when it pulls all the nutrients and stuff out and that forms the harder stool um, so really important to have lots of you know one and a half liters to two liters of water a day is really important exercise is a little bit a little bit difficult obviously when you've got someone with a spinal cord injury but just doing any kind of activity is great regular exercise all the all the things all the things that you know people say diet yeah <laughs> Uh, when people have quite intensive bowel management routines or even even not as intensive and they might have a spinal cord injury but are able to still go to the bathroom, is there anything that people should steer clear from if they need to, like even a more involved bowel management? So is there anything that you would recommend? Um, look, I, I think it's such an individual thing um, and that's why I think it's really really important to work closely with your healthcare professional um, as to what works best for you and what works best for your lifestyle. So that's a little bit of a hard one to answer because it is such an individualised thing um, and, and everyone and what works for, let's say what works for me wouldn't work for you. So everybody is different. So I, I could sit here and say that Peristin is fantastic, it's excellent, but if it's not actually on the right person, it's not going to work. You need to make sure that whatever treatment you're doing is actually suitable suitable for the person that you're prescribing it for. You know, look at things like mobility. You know, as you were saying before, mobility, if they're sitting in a chair all day, if they don't have access to, to care workers or support workers to assist them with stuff. Um, so all those things really need to come into play and need to come into the discussions. Because Peristine may be great, but if they have no one that can do it for them, it's obviously not going to work for them. Okay. Yeah. And is there a difference for any considerations that we need to take men and women individually or is it the same deal 
for everybody? Yeah, look, pretty much the same. I mean, um, there's no huge difference between um, men and women, not at all. There's pretty much, they've, they've both got the same issues. Sometimes that um, women, the transit time, so that's the time that the stool takes to move through the bowel can be a little bit slower in women. So men, it's about 1.9 days. Women, it's about 2.4. So it's just a tiny little bit slower for women. Um, but we ha- we have every prerogative to take our time with it. So <laughs> and, and it's, on our, it's on our time. We we can we can uh, dictate that one. <laughs> oh, that, that's an interesting statistic. So is it is it um what are the factors there that makes that a little bit different from men? Probably more anatomy and size. So to do with men, men generally are a little bit bigger and, and physically a little bit bigger. So one of one of the really big ones um, that really good questions here that I was really big on was was sex is a really big one. Doing something like peristine, so doing your bowel care or doing something like peristine, emptying your bowels before sex is really important because obviously when you do have sex there is that pressure that's put on your bowel. There's also a little product that we make called anal plugs, which are absolutely phenomenal little things and what they basically do is it's almost like a tampon for your bum so basically what you do is pop a bit of lubricant on it pop it into your bottom and what happens is that catches any leakage um, or anything it's not going to hold in a whole stool but if you've got someone wanting to have sex and just have that little bit of extra security it's it's a really really great product and they're, they're pretty inexpensive that's a really good option just to give people that extra bit of confidence because obviously bowel care and spinal cord injury and sex um, can cause a lot of anxiety in people as well. I guess based on our other discussion that we had about bladder management and then this one, is there anywhere where you see us sex and spontaneity? Would there still be, there's always an element of planning, I guess, when it comes to. Look, I think it does come down to planning. It, it often does come down to good planning. Um, and I think with good planning, you're a little bit more at ease as well. So, yeah, but I guess the thing I love about Peristin is that you've got that predictability. So the idea is, let's say you do it at 8 o'clock in the morning, you've done your bowel care at 8 o'clock in the morning, you know you're pretty safe till the next day or the day after. So then you actually know that, yeah, I'm empty and I'm, I'm pretty confident about doing it. But, look, anything intimate um, really does does come down to good planning. So when it comes to things like pregnancy and bowel care, is there anything that we need to uh, keep in mind, especially with the weight of the baby growing? Yeah, so um, we don't recommend peristine during uh, pregnancy, so it's something you do have to stop. Um, Reason being that there's just no data on the effect of having that that pressure in your bottom um, and the effect that that actually may have on the baby. In regards to pregnancy, I think the biggest thing is really watching your constipation. You do tend to get a little bit more constipated when you're pregnant and making sure you're keeping up your fluids. They're going to be the two really big things to watch watch when you're um, when you're pregnant. But it's only for a short period of your life and you get this beautiful, beautiful little package at the end of it. So. And for what about children who have a spinal cord injury or neuro disability and uh, they might also have some bowel management care. Is there any? Is there any anything we need to probably take a bit more stock of at this sort of um, period? Absolutely. So, so often you'll find in adults um, with your bowel care. When I was talking about those transit times where women are a little bit slower, often people can do their bowel care every second day. So, as you're an adult, you can do it every second day. What we find with children is that their digestive systems are just that little bit more immature, so they really need to do it every single day. Trying to do it at the same time. I mean, I think the thing I really love about my job is that I have children who have spina bifida who at age nine are still going to school in nappies, going to mainstream school in nappies. They get teased. They're getting picked on, which which unfortunately is something that happens before. And um, it's really heartbreaking, but... I had a child recently who started peristine who is now doing a peristine. She's wearing underpants um, and she's actually doing her catheters herself. And she actually rang me up to tell me that she's not picked on at school anymore and she's not called the smelly child. So to me, that is just exactly what I'm here for. I'm here to change people's lives and make a difference in people's lives.
So I guess this is something that, I mean, we, we haven't really touched on confidence level, bladder management, bowel management and confidence level, but for this one, bowel management. And for this girl, obviously, this was a huge downer confidence wise for her, um, which is incredibly heartbreaking for the formative years of you know, your life and you don't even really know who you are yet and you're trying to get used to all these other things as well. Yep. You know, and you can have the exact same experience with confidence for an adult as well who may never have known. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it's just I think until you really experience how debilitating these things can be, it's really hard to probably understand. But I'm guessing most of the people who do have a spinal cord injury um, or a a neurogenic belt kind of understand these things um, and then they can be really challenging. Mm. Anything we can, you know, we can do to try and improve things, um, make things a little bit easier. Um, But but same as an adult, you know, it's very hard to maintain a job when you're at a job in the middle of the day and you have to go home to change yourself. And and those kinds of interruptions makes it very hard. And and really what we want to do, especially is, is... you know, looking at the inter- introduction of the NDIS is we want people to be social and they want people to to live their lives as, as normally as possible. I hate using that word, you know, as, as close to normal as possible because there really is no... Their problem. version of normal. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. So, so I hate that word because there is no normal. There's a confidence for work. There's a confidence in socialisation. If people are dating, for example, and they're going on a date, it all kind of falls to the umbrella of just wanting to be as independent as possible in whatever version of independence they are. So essentially I always say I want people to be in control of their bowels as opposed to their bowels being in control of them. And that's ultimately yeah. what you want to achieve. Yeah, 100%. Just independence for everybody. Absolutely. Okay. Is there anything um, you would like to add? Um, I've done all my questions. No, <laughs> no look, I think, um, you know, I'm very happy to answer any questions needed. Coloplast really have um, an amazing group of people, an amazing number of resources. You know, get out there and Google it. If, if you find that you're not happy in your bowel management routine, discuss it with your healthcare professional, have a chat about it. You know, there is so many awesome Facebook groups out there that chat about different kinds of treatments and different things that work for other people. Um, so, yeah, so always definitely strive to improve everything, improve your situation. Awesome. Well, thank you very much again. Thank you so much, Edwina. This was this is really insightful. Absolutely. Look, absolute pleasure, Susan. It's always really fun to come and talk, talk for an hour about poo. <laughs> Hey, someone's got to do it. Hey, this is has to be the both of us. <laughs> You've been listening to Have the Nerve, a podcast by Spinal Cord Injuries Australia. If you would like to know more about what we've discussed in this episode, please check the show notes for details and visit scia.org.au for more information. As mentioned earlier, this podcast is one of two episodes about continence health. We would love to continue the conversation. If you have anything you would like to ask, drop us a comment on our forum at scia.org.au forward slash forum or email us at community at scia.org.au. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please consider giving us a five-star review. Your review will help us get the word out there. And finally, we're also on social media. You can find Spinal Cord Injuries Australia on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Thank you for listening.